In the evening, he took the stork's pictures with him from the office. He took his poetry dedicated to me and went home earlier than usual. When he came, he took our family book at home, brought the pictures into the room, arranged them on the table, and looked at them in silence for a long time. Some academics rang him up, but he did not answer the phone. Our son and daughter-in-law went to work in the morning, taking the little grandson to the kindergarten, and I had to give a lecture at 8.30, so I left. When our son dropped in for a dinner, he found his father dead. My husband was courageous and a strong man, but they finished off even him. He committed suicide on the day of the second anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster. On the night of April 26, 1986, 24 minutes past one anti-meridian, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was shocked by two strong explosions. It was the critical moment of my life. It was death. I understood myself what it is. The row B wall fell and the top of the reactor was seen. Can you imagine it? And there was the enormous neutron current. And it was such a glow like, you know, gas stove burning, something like that. All the plant's radiation dosimeters went off scale. It was impossible to measure the radiation level. The chief detector told the shift engineer to go to the reactor hall to see what had happened. So we managed to find out that there is no reactor indeed at the cost of one man's life. Well, literally during the first hours. We think that it was as if Ukraine underwent a nuclear strike. That was the war. Can you understand? Many plants employees felt sick. It seemed to some that things were expanding. The first victims of Chernobyl died of radiation some minutes after the explosion. The ambulances carried the dark brown burnt bodies emitting radiation. Dozens of men doomed to death were evacuated out of the unit in a hurry. Meanwhile, the country was sleeping in peace. Thousands of soldiers, statesmen, and scientists did not know that Chernobyl had come into their lives for now and forever. Moscow night operators got to know about the accident first. The control panel indicated the alarm signal from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The signal code started to change at an ever-increasing rate. One, two, three, four. That meant there was a fire, explosion, nuclear, and radiation hazard situation in there. Night telephone calls raised all the country's top leadership. So, same they called me at 7 o'clock in the morning via government switchboard telephone when I was at the state villa. The caller was Meritz, the Minister of Energy, Anatoly Ivanovich Meritz. He said that there happened an accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. An explosion had occurred. I asked him, tell me plainly what has happened, what has exploded, etc. He said, I have been informed last night, so I do not know exactly. I said, find out quickly what has happened. That morning, academician Legasov suddenly felt an intense longing to smoke a pipe, as he did in his far younger, foppish days. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. His wife was bustling about in the kitchen as usual. A spring day was starting outside. What shall I do today? Shall I go to the sub-department at the Lennon Hills? Shall I forget about everything and take the family to the country cottage? Or shall I go to the meeting of the party officials and senior executives of the Ministry of the Middle Engineering? The habit overcame him. The academician Legasov went to the party meeting on Saturday morning of April 26, 1986. Academician Legasov's notes. Frankly speaking, the report was boring. Our elderly minister stated in a loud voice how good everything is at his office. Singing odes to the atom for peace, he mentioned in passing, true, they have done it in Chernobyl now, kind of a minor accident, but it will not impede the progress of nuclear power engineering. 
In the meanwhile, the Kremlin was searching hastily for nuclear physicians to send them on the mission to Chernobyl. But on Saturday evenings, everybody was having a rest at one's country cottages. There was only one high-ranking official related to science in the Moscow area that day, Valery Legasov, senior deputy director of the Kurchatov Institute of Atomic Energy, but he did not specialize in reactors. He was a chemist, though a nuclear chemist, a noted chemist, a Lenin Prize winner. Many people hated him. Being the son of an executive of Foreign Department of the Communist Party Central Committee, Legasov became an academician at the age of 45. He was happily married to a guard officer's daughter, a beautiful woman named Margarita. The Legasovs owned a detached house located at the prestigious Pekotnaya Street, where the senior scientists lived. His neighbor and patron was the almighty head of the Academy of Science, Anatoly Alexandrov. Legasov was present at the party meeting, not knowing that at the very instant all his future destiny was being decided. The first injured persons had already been taken from Chernobyl to Moscow. It was a horrifying sight. The radiation damage so strong that people's skin came off when taking off their clothes. Why had not their clothes been changed before? There are a lot of questions. However, of course, people hope to survive until dying. The Gasov arrived at Chernobyl that evening. The black motorcade of the Volgas was going at full speed from Kiev airport, and all of a sudden, at a distance some kilometers away from the plant, it slowed down. The newly arrived saw the phantasmagoria. Here is how academician Legasov would remember that. Well, in my conception, as I see it, a nuclear power plant is a structure that never spews out anything. Well, I do not know what to say. When one can see a nuclear power plant, it is a high pipe with no smoke there. And suddenly, the nuclear power plant and a glow, a reflected glow of burning hot graphite that is above the plant. Even not reaching the city of Pripyat, one could see the blood-red sky that shone with a reflected light. That was not the reactor. It had never been like that. Legasov passed the Chernobyl plant's control post and almost at once changed the Volga for a military helicopter. He flew with Bara Shabina, deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR, an official and a scientist. From the height of 100 meters, they tried to examine the accident area looking through the glasses. The helicopter jolted strongly in the highly radioactive field. It could fall down at any moment. Shouting down the engine roar, Sherbina asked Legasov, there is a crimson color beneath, what is it? To which he got the answer, it is not a light, it is death. We are approaching to the power unit. The second line pipe was seen. Down, 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 down. Look over there. Film the ruins. What? The very ruins. Up, you've got it. Catch the place and catch it. Catch where the smoke comes out, where, where, the, where the smoke is seen. Legasov understood that the worst thing had happened. The reactor exploded. It literally was turned inside out. Was the population of the cities nearest to Chernobyl's plant in the epicenter of the nuclear explosion? The people evacuation had to be started immediately. In the first place, Pripyat, the city nearest to the Chernobyl plant, had to be saved. But nobody dared to do it. To start evacuation is a very serious decision. Unfortunately, that time everybody was afraid of the words. What is Grand Duchess Maria Alexandrovna's opinion? It means that it was necessary to listen to the Moscow leader's opinion only. But the leader was not available, so nobody could make a decision. We delivered 2,600 buses, four trains for the purpose of evacuation. Everything was provided and supplied at once. They were in a few hours on the spot, and they were ready to evacuate people. But again, the leader's decision was anticipated. Academician Legasov hurried both statesmen and scientists. That was Valery Alexeyevich, who was the first to say to the government members at 11 p.m. on April 26th, 
Guys, the decision concerning the evacuation of Pripyat population must be made promptly. Oh no, they answered. In what case? In that case, everybody will know about it. He said, no, the decision must be made or else we will kill so many people. Meanwhile, the reactor debris continued to live. They burned and the radioactive stench was taken with the smoke onto the surface. Millions of Curie. The spreading cloud of Chernobyl covered the territory increasingly. With a sigh of relief, Legasov saw the chemical defense troops entering Chernobyl on the night of April 27th. They were equipped with special armored personnel carriers, and the most important thing was that they had dosimeters designated for the case of nuclear war. Only then radioactive background could be measured. 1,000, 1,500, 7,000, 9,000 Rentgen per hour. A man spent several minutes in that field, then would die a dreadful death. Legasov took a dosimeter and came close to the destroyed unit using armored personnel carrier. Radiation coming from the reactor had to be stopped by all means. He understood that he would have to send dozens or even hundreds of men to their doom. Maybe he wanted to deserve such a right, did he not? There was so high level gamma field that whether neutrons were present or not, the dosimeter shut up at once and no indication display. His trip was harmful for his health. I told him from the corner, Valery Alexandrovich, you should not have gone there at all. Oh my God, I should not have said that to him. The man risked his life. I think he got a very high radiation dose then. Legasov suggested using military aviation to attack the reactor without waiting until morning. The military helicopters soared up in the Chernobyl sky. Every helicopter had bags of cement and sand on board. Pilots were set a goal to drop the loads exactly on the glowing orifices. In order to do that, the helicopters had to hover above the radiation source. Extremely high precision and inconceivable courage were required from the pilots. They understood they were making a suicide mission. The bags were dropped from a height of 200 meters. Falling bags made the clouds of radioactive dust, and every flight the pilots got sicker, but like ones possessed, went on working. Legasov was watching the operation from the next unit's roof. His words that Chernobyl was 75 Hiroshima's and Nagasaki's combined remained in my memory. 75. That's why he insisted on the immediate evacuation of people. Only 36 hours after the explosion, Legasov managed to achieve his purpose. On April 27th at 11 a.m., the message concerning the general evacuation came through on the local radio of the Pripyat town. The only thing they said was that people should take the three days' supply of food and water and not to take anything else. Actually, even the refrigerators were not switched off. Not all who had alarm systems in their flat switched it on also. They remembered. Nobody said anything. Everybody was silent, and then there was a bustle. All were turned out of the houses, turned out at the pistol's point. Take your documents only and nothing else. We took our documents and left. From academician Legasov's notes, I understood that the city would evacuate forever, but I was not able to explain it to the people psychologically because I reasoned that if the evacuation was announced to people right now, it would take longer than planned, and an increase in activity was already significant. The people would pack up their things for a very long time, and we could not wait. So I recommended, and Sherbina agreed with me, announcing that for the present we could not say how long the evacuation would be for. In the morning, the women were still waking with baby baggies, and the children were still playing games in the streets of Pripyat. But by half past two, the city would become deserted. The evacuation was carried out at lightning speed. 45,000 people of the total population of 61,000 were taken out within three and a half hours. The streets were lighted, but there was no light in any window. When one looked from the height of the 12th floor of the hotel, it was a horrifying sight. It made even more horrible impression on me than the destroyed unit. Just imagine the dead city. My profound impression was created by a dog. When people escaped on the first, second, third day, 
Dogs came to men when they starved. They came to the first man and looked into his eye because they did not understand what had happened. It seemed that there were people, but the hosts were not allowed to take the dogs with them. The dogs had to hunt for food. They caught a hen, brought it, and when they saw the man, they dropped it, understanding that they should not have touched the hen. Then, when the man passed, they would take the hen again. Despite the pilot's efforts, radiation was not stopped. The nuclear fuel remaining in the reactor became hot. Its temperature increased, getting to 2,000 degrees Celsius. And all this burning hot mass was above the water reservoir that was under the reactor. Gloomy and angry, Legasov smoked without interruption and made manual calculations on paper. Soon, the calculations confirmed his worst assumptions. If the fuel melted down the floor and got to the water, the second explosion would occur at Chernobyl nuclear power plant, after which there would be no living thing within a radius of 100 kilometers. That was what they were afraid of, because if all the radioactive substances had released from the remaining fuel, then it would have been necessary to evacuate Kiev, Chernigov, Zidomir, regions all together, not only a 30-kilometer zone. Meanwhile, the Chernobyl cloud crossed the border of Sweden. On the basis of the wind direction, the Swedish radiologist determined the probable source. And on April 30th, 1986, on the third day after the explosion, the Swedish press reported to the world about the nuclear accident in the USSR. After that, central Soviet newspapers also published the paragraphs concerning the accident. The whole world was intensively waiting to see how the Soviet Union would celebrate the May Day. That would be the official declaration concerning Chernobyl. To cancel the celebration meant to confirm the fact that a nuclear disaster had occurred in the USSR. People's health or the country's political image, what was to be done? There were different opinions in the Politburo. They considered in Moscow that canceling the demonstration would be a crime against the country. Ligasov tried to make out in Chernobyl that holding the parade would be a crime against the people. Moscow was a winner. Margarita Ligasova's diary. The burnt people were carried to Moscow but nobody told me when my husband would come back. At last, on May 5th, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the doorbell rang. A man, dressed in a black suit, stood on the doorstep and kept a plastic bag instead of his suitcase, as usual. It was Valerie, very brown. I asked, it is very hot in Chernobyl, isn't it? He looked at me and answered, too hot. It turned out that the tan was nuclear. They found Legasov on the night of May 5th. He was told to come to the Politburo. He was in Moscow in the morning. He was met by his institute colleagues. They tried to clean him as much as possible. They took the samples of his hair and fingernails for analysis. Everything was contaminated. As a matter of fact, he was impregnated with radiation to his fingertips. After the necessary measurements, he came home being unable to overcome a temptation. He spent only 35 minutes with the family and rushed to the Kremlin, ignoring all road signs and traffic lights. Legasov was hardly in time for the beginning of the meeting. The Secretary General opened the meeting with a question. For that moment, he did not wonder who was to blame, but he wondered much what had to be done then. Virtually, generally speaking, the Chernobyl became one of the last straws that broke the Soviet Union's back. That is, it showed the unreliability of the formation. You know, the people found out themselves. So the Chernobyl was a catastrophe for Gorbachev. Of course, personal catastrophe. Being tired without getting a wink of sleep for several nights, Legasov was talking for a long time about the situation in Chernobyl. Such an unpreparedness, disorder, fear, like in 1941, and even worse with the same breast courage and despair, but with the same unpreparedness. He said that for the moment, the situation had not been stabilized. The Politburo members discussed whether to increase the population's maximum permissible radiation dose 10 or even 50 times in special cases. For that moment, they decided to send journalists to the area next to the zone in order to report about the area's normal life activity. After the meeting, all the first string members of the commission stayed in Moscow. All of them had apparent radiation injury, nuclear tan, barking cough and sickness. Legasov felt as bad as the others, but he returned to Chernobyl. His main enemy, the destroyed reactor, is still alive and unpredictable.
The temperature beneath the debris continued to increase. One did not manage to stop it. It seemed that the second explosion was unavoidable, but at that very moment a thought occurred to Legasov. It must be checked how much water was beneath the reactor. If it was too little water, we would have nothing to fear. There would be no thermal explosion. A volunteer crew went to the raging nuclear hell beneath the reactor. The men went so they were exposed to radiation. It was necessary to approach beneath the reactor. The fact was that they had no communications, and they were waited for. Well, the door was opened approximately at half past two at night. And such a man as Gortsikov came into the office first. He looked completely aloof, so when Siliev asked him what was in there, Isakov said sinking heavily into the chair in a state of complete fatigue that there was just 200 tons of water and that there was an incredible pother. All hugged and kissed one another. It's hard for me to remember that now. It was clear there would be no explosion, but Legasov managed to win a final victory only by mid-May. The temperature under the debris began to fall. The radiation source was sealed. The pilots who attacked the reactor became the heroes of the Soviet Union. Many of them were awarded posthumously. Valery Legasov was nominated for an award of Hero of Socialist Labor. The accident consequences were localized. The academician accomplished his mission and could leave for Moscow, but he did not go. The governmental commission members were changed, but he stayed in Chernobyl despite everything. He had been working for three months in the zone. No one of his rank could endure such long shift working. His precise radiation dose had not been known by now. He kept his personal dosimeter in a safe place as far as possible from the sources. If they had known that the radiation dose was too high, he would have been suspended from work. He went through the dangerous fields as if he did not care of the radiation. Did he defy danger? Nine months after the accident, he said in an interview with the Isvetia, I made no heroic efforts in there, but there was something keeping him in Chernobyl. From Academician Legasov's notes, Chernobyl was to have happened some years before on the Kola Peninsula when they detected by chance that a welder wishing to perform his job quicker and get a bonus put the electrodes into the channel of the main line in the most important place and then welded them on the top slightly. If we had not detected it, we would have lost the Kola Peninsula in whole. If academician Legasov said that one could set a folding bed on a reactor and sleep staying there for days and nights, then as a matter of principle, we considered such a reactor safer. So we displayed, it is to say, some neglecting and disregarding in respect of radiation safety. It was so at any time and place. Nuclear engineer circles assigned a part of Cassandra to Legasov. There could be an apocalypse at any time, he said with passion about it at the meetings, but no one believed him. From Academician Legasov's notes, One day I heard Deputy Energy Minister Ponomarev Stepnov's words that our reactors were very dangerous. I examined the issue in details and started to say that the next reactor generation was necessary. I brought a storm about my ear, especially from Minister Slavsky, who almost stamped his feet shouting that I was ignorant and unskilled and that I meddled in other people's affairs. Legasov's physicist colleagues considered him a chemistry outskirts boy. Once somebody called him the academician like that. He had a presentiment of the disaster and so he hurried. He started organizing an expert team on the different reactors radiation safety assessment. He insisted on the creation of the safety measurements laboratory at the Kurchatov Institute. He was too late. The Chernobyl reactor exploded before the academician managed to prove something. On July 5, 1986, two months after the explosion, Legasov flew to Moscow to a regular secret Politburo meeting. He took a cassette with him which contained the Chernobyl reactor operator's talk several seconds before the explosion. The power plant's black box recorded the talks. One said, well, I'm not citing him word for word. Ivan Ivanovich, look here, he said. This was printed in the installation manual. And then that was struck out, and another thing was written. He said, so what should I do? Should I follow as printed or as corrected by hand? That one said, well, you should do as corrected by hand. 
Sort of this kind of talk. By that time, the plant's workers had already been taken to court. Legasov said that it was not only their fault, the reactor itself was dangerous. There was a serious miscalculation in its design, and the designer had been repeatedly told about that. Such reactors were used only in our country and nowhere else. All that was new for the Politburo's members. Valery Alexievich returned to Chernobyl pleased with himself, but soon he knew that nothing would change. The design of the same reactors would go on in the Soviet Union. Only the plant's workers would be brought to trial. The containment construction was carried out around the clock. Watching the constructions, Legasov smoked at the window throughout the nights. His subordinates avoided disturbing the academician on such nights. They knew they could see tears in his eyes. The first, second, the third, the fourth. He followed that route for the tenth time, probably. He worried and counted the steps absentmindedly. International Atomic Energy Agency's experts were taking their seats behind the heavy door. They were waiting for the Soviet colleagues' detailed and true story about the Chernobyl accident. The session was just about to begin, but academician Legasov could not make up his mind to enter the room. A silly humorous rhyme was running in his head. The acceleration is an important factor, but the blow-up was the reactor. And now our atom for peace is cursed by the whole Europe like this. In the summer of 1986, the European countries began complaining of the Chernobyl radiation. There were strange knobs on the spruces and pines named the Witch's Brush. Animal monsters were born. The West Press reported that there had been 192 tons of nuclear fuel in the Chernobyl reactor cavity before the explosion. And the press wondered how much uranium and plutonium had escaped to the Earth's atmosphere. Nobody was sure that after the accident, neither Europe nor perhaps some far countries would claim compensations relating to the accident consequences. The consequences related to the nuclear fallout that occurred on their territory. The Politburo told Legasov to make excuses to Europe. He and his team had been sweating over this report the whole summer. By the end of August, the 400-page work was prepared and submitted to be censored. Generally, all accidents in the Soviet Union were the classified information. No accident may occur under socialism, a priority. When our report got to the Central Committee of the Communist Party, then the department manager appended the following resolution. The report contains the information discrediting the state of the Soviet Union's science and technology. The authors are thought to be brought to criminal responsibility and the responsibility to the Communist Party. And it was addressed to the chairman of the Committee of State Security, KGB, and to the head of Party Control Commission. We had to cut the report. Legasov's task was in reassuring the world public. But would they believe it? The state's honor was a task. The academician was on firm ground in the world of formulae and even in the radioactive fields of Chernobyl, but he was a dilettante in politics. That is why their last steps were so hard for him that moment. The ninth, the tenth, it is time. On August 25, 1986, 500 top nuclear experts of the world assembled for a special conference of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. The Soviet delegation headed by the academician Valery Legasov, the senior deputy director of the Kurchov Institute of Atomic Energy, submitted the detailed report of the Chernobyl accident. Legasov behaved confidently. There was not a shadow of doubt on his face. He emphasized that only 3% of the fuel had left the reactor. It was not too much on a world scale. He talked in details about the unique radiation pollution control technology. The report lasted for five hours. At the end of the report, the audience gave him a standing ovation. The world that hated us for Chernobyl had taken off their hats to him, writes the Perestroika Press later. The International Atomic Energy Agency's experts were satisfied with the Russian academician's reports. There were no blames to the USSR. Valery Legasov became the man of the year and was included in the top 10 of the world's most famous scientists. It was a triumph.
The way he acted and responded said that he was a strong, sober man that was in full control of the situation and gave the snappy answers to the numerous questions asked. Moreover, after the five-hour report, he answered the numerous questions for several hours. In autumn of 1986, the wave of awarding started in Moscow. The Chernobyl cleanup veterans were presented with orders along with the actors. There was no doubt that on September 1st, on his 50th birthday, Akademishin Nagasov would be presented with the gold star of the hero of the socialist labor. On the day of his birthday, he brought home the Slava watch with an inscription. Neither him nor the 18 members of his team got any award. But I was rather prejudiced against him, like to one of those who lied to us, you see. He was one of many for me. He was a representative of the system. And further, when I saw the documents signed by him, I changed my mind in general. And I began to understand him as a man that had been crossed up. Chernobyl, the autumn of 1986. Some rare shots. Akademishin Legasov is laughing. A journalist question made him laugh. Is it harmful for health to be in Chernobyl? Well, will I be able to have children then? Is it okay for me? It is now since when you will be able to have children. You have a child, I tell you. I have been working with radiation sources since 1964, and I have children. It is all right concerning this thing, so do not worry. <laughs> it has a stimulating effect, like pepper or medicine. It stimulates in low doses. It has no effect in middle doses. It is harmful in high doses, so you just get a stimulating dose. His own dose had already been lethal. From Margarita Ligasova's diary. He constantly coughs. He eats little or nothing. He feels sick. He cannot stand the kitchen odors. He grows thin quickly. He is constantly in a bad mood. He suffers from insomnia. He goes to sleep at 11 p.m., but gets up in an hour or an hour and a half. He runs out, lights up a cigarette, and drops one cigarette after another. You can be without sleep for one day or two days, but if you have not been sleeping for a year and a half, it is terrible. On the eve of the new year, 1987, a terrible assumption visited the Legosov's place like a judgment. Cancer. Not baptized and brought up in atheistic manner, he began rereading the Bible. Like in his youth, he composes poetry again. How to break such a firm circle? Where to find the weak link? In order to open it, and at a stroke to return the past for you and me. Well, Valery Legasov entered our clinical hospital on June 11th and stayed there until June 19th, 1987. When in hospital, his status was assessed as a deep reactive state with depression tint against the background of high defatigation and frustration caused by the complicated crisis situation. In summer 1987, the information came as a bombshell. At last, the stalkers managed to clear the debris to get inside the Chernobyl reactor and send sensational information to Moscow. There was no fuel in the reactor. But there were huge bags of sand dropped from the helicopter everywhere. Nuclear circles animatedly discussed the news. There was an opinion that the helicopter bombing suggested by Legasov was a fatal mistake. Even if the bags hit the target, it would be pointless anyway. There was no fuel, so there was no second explosion hazard. So did Legasov and his team fight against emptiness? Did the pilots all without exception lose their lives in vain? When we got to the reactor cavity and saw that there was no active zone and that the reactor cavity was empty, no idea would have occurred to one concerning dropping anything there. All these decisions were made of inadequate perception of reality in the absence of reliable information. 
It surely was a wrong decision, which has not led to anything good. It was just a certain man's mistake. Well, nobody's perfect. Even an academician can make a mistake. Perhaps academician Nagasov felt those days that his world had collapsed. His friends consoled him, saying that the issue of the fuel is complicated and disputable. His enemies immediately delivered their judgment. How was that? Did the scientist of worldwide reputation make dozens of people go to their doom and then lie to the whole world, inducing a thunderous applause? On the night of August 29, 1987, being already in the hospital, Valery Legasov took a lethal dose of sleeping medicine. At school, he was expected to have a brilliant future. Only once he made trouble in a big way, but how it was, being a secretary of the school, the Young Communist League, he rewrote the rules of the All-Union Leninist Young Communist League because he considered that the rules currently in force were very bad. Only Stalin's death saved a cheeky schoolboy. These pictures were on the wall at Legasov's office. One photo showed a nuclear plant, the other showed storks. The academician's favorite subject was an academic question of whether it was possible to combine wildlife with modern production. In the old days, one sought salvation in technology, but now one seeks salvation from the technology. His suicidal attempt failed. The doctor saved Legasov's life, and soon he would be absorbed in his work. Well, people discovered fire, someone who was there first. I do not know a bonfire, welfare. Then they learned how to warm themselves near the fire, and they learned how to roast food, a great welfare. But it had been a long way to go until people were able to use the fire in a modern manner. Then conflagrations and other troubles began. What a sin it was for a man who wanted to warm and provide himself. What was the main cause of the Chernobyl accident? Legasov collected information analyzed and put down his conclusions. He felt that his strength was failing him, so he hurried up. For this time, he had no right to be late. He must be heard. It is the call of my duty to tell you all about it. That was the name of the article for Pravda that was written by Legasov in autumn 1987. He stated that nobody is seriously engaged in nuclear industry safety. The Energy Ministry and the Ministry of the Middle Engineering fought against one another. And the officials of the newly created Gosatom Nadzora have been doing their best to get offices, positions, flats for themselves from their superiors that had little influence on the nuclear energy quality. The Chernobyl accident was a pinnacle, a peak of an improper management over dozens of years. Legasov concluded, the staunch communist having a 30-year experience encroached upon the holy of holies, the economic basis of the Soviet state. Legasov's article was quite in the spirit of the perestroika, but nobody liked it and it was not published. Then he took a dictating machine. He was alone at night in the silence of his office, so he was able not to think of censure and use strong language. From academician Legasov's notes, it turned out like there is no guilty in the world story by Tolstoy. Not only one person was guilty of the accident. The plant's workers made many blunders. The designer was told about the reactor drawback many times, but he wished no additional work. But the main criminals were not the staff, and even the designer, but the Gosplan, State Planning Committee, management. They were shown that it was dangerous to build nuclear plants without containment, but they did not care a fig, because the containment increased the plant's cost by 30%. All the world's accidents develop on the same scenario. The mistakes are accumulated, the insignificant errors, every one of which is not dangerous by itself, but then there are a lot of them, and finally a critical mass occurs. Then a disaster happens, whether at a nuclear plant, on board a plane, or in one man's personal life. His wildest dream was in creating the Technological Risk Institute, but the institute was not created due to many reasons, so no man is a prophet in his own country. It happens so often. You see, many ideas expressed were not clear at all. Moreover, I stress the Soviet Union's official philosophy generally excluded the very concept of an acceptable risk. Valery Alexandrovich was worried very much about the complications in respect of the institute creation. But soon good news came. Anatoly Alexandrov, the head of the Academy of Science, officially announced at the Kurchartov Institute staff meeting that Valery Legasov had been nominated to the title of Hero of Socialist Labor for the courage displayed during the containment of the Chernobyl accident. Alexandrov hugged the scientist, and after that, the colleagues congratulated the academician heartily. 
There was an opinion that Legasov worked at the Institute, which one day had designed the very reactor, and hence it would be misunderstood, and we suggest that awarding him with the title of the hero of socialist labor. There was a hot discussion, and the majority of our group members supported his award, that he had no relation to the reactor. By the way, he is not a reactor engineer. He specializes in other things. A decree was issued the next morning. Legasov's name was not in the list of receivers. And here is the result, my uselessness. This sad line appeared in Valery Legasov's poem, written in 1987. And in another poem, I cannot keep on living. Last months, he felt so poorly that the burning cigarettes dropped on his clothes. His fingers cannot support such a load. He is apathetic, and no good news or events make him happy anymore. However, Legasov made one more dash. He developed the plan of the Soviet designated to eliminate the stagnation in science. And on April 26, 1988, he submitted the plan to the Academy of Sciences. The plan was rejected. It is a pity that we did not learn a lesson from Chernobyl, the academician said that day. He took his stork's pictures with him from the office, took his poetry dedicated to his wife, and came home earlier than usual. That was a special day, the second anniversary of the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. He took the family book, arranged the pictures on a table, and looked at them in silence for a long time. The phone was ringing off the hook, but he did not answer it. His wife and children went to work in the morning, taking little grandson to kindergarten. When his son dropped in for dinner, he found his father dead. It was impossible to unbind the knot of the string, an interrogator would later say. I was called from the directorate and told to check the level of radioactivity in academician Legasov's papers, notebooks, personal things, because they might be radioactive. And you see, when checked them all, put the things on the table, polyethylene, of course, the radiation was at his office. Virtually everything was highly radioactive. I still remember the Geiger counter sound, the empty room and the recording counter. My life was a struggle in which I was beaten. Not only beaten, but downtrodden, with such broken destiny, cursing and damning it. I'm so thankful for you, only for you being such as you are. Valery Legasov was buried in Novo Dievici Cemetery. The obituary notice in Pravda said that the Soviet scientist had undergone bereavement, but it did not mention that the scientist had committed suicide. And in three weeks, the very Pravda published the article, It is the call of my duty to tell you about it. And 10 years after the Chernobyl tragedy, Valery Legasov will be a holder of the gold star as the hero of Russia for his courage, fortitude, and heroism.